So they all get ready, they put on their ihram, they put on all their clothing, they bring all their equipment and whatnot with them. And they set out towards Makkah from Medina for the purpose of performing Umrah. That for the first time they're going to be able to, all of them at once, worship around the Kaaba, perform Tawaf and do Umrah. And not only that, but they're guaranteed of it by this dream that the Prophet ﷺ had. So along the way, a group from the Quraysh from Makkah comes out and meets them. And they're not too happy about this. They don't want the Muslims to be performing Umrah. And with all this excitement and build up, and they've come a very long distance. If you've been to Makkah, it's, it's like a two hour drive from Medina to Makkah. So going on foot takes a very long time. And they've come so far and you can imagine how tired they are and how excited they were. And to now meet this group of people from Makkah who are now telling them that no, you can't. And then tensions start to build. There's a possibility that they're going to fight. So the Prophet ﷺ, he meets with the people of Makkah and they decide to make some sort of agreement. And the Treaty of Hudaybiyah that they end up agreeing to is extremely disadvantageous to the Muslims. That it caused a lot of grumbling. Some of the terms in it are that when the actual treaty is written, it doesn't refer to Muhammad ﷺ as the Messenger of Allah. And they have to remove this from the, the document that they're writing. And Ali anhu who's writing it, he, he, he refuses to remove it. And the Prophet ﷺ he has to remove that himself because Ali does not want to remove that because it's, it, he, it's so disrespectful for him to remove such a thing from the document. That it includes things like uh, people from Medina have a right of return back to Makkah, but Muslims in Makkah don't get a right of return back to Medina. And there are other things. And, this, and, and on top, the, the, the cherry on top of all this is that the Muslims agree that they're not going to actually perform Umrah this year. They're going to have to go home all the way back and then come back next year to perform Umrah. And this is causing some grumblings among the Muslims. They're kind of, you know, disappointed. And then these verses come down. That Allah is affirming that what the Prophet ﷺ, not only what he did was good, but he refers to it as a victory. He says, indeed, we have given you, O Muhammad, a clear conquest, a clear victory. That Allah may forgive you what proceeded of your sin and what will follow, and complete his favor upon you and guide you to a straight path. And that Allah may aid you with a mighty victory. It is he who sent down tranquility into the hearts of the believers, that they would increase in faith along with their present faith. And to Allah belong the soldiers of the heavens and the earth, and ever is Allah knowing and wise. And the surah goes on like this. And there's a lot of lessons to be taken from this, but what I want to focus on here is how the Prophet ﷺ communicated with people. That this was a situation where he was met with people who were completely opposed to him, who were ready to take up arms against him. And how did he handle that situation? was a demonstration of how the Prophet ﷺ was very strategic in his actions. He was very strategic in his word choice. And that got him very far. And that's a lesson that we can take. The Prophet ﷺ, he knows what he wants when he's going on this Umrah and he's negotiating with the Makkans. What he wants is peace, that he doesn't want violence between the two sides. He wants to perform Umrah. And he knows those are his goals. And with that in mind, he's willing to set aside something in the short term for the bigger picture. That he says, okay, we'll make Umrah next year. We'll still make Umrah, it'll just be next year. Right? And we'll accept all these terms which are not advantageous to us. But if we get what we want, then that's still good. And how we can apply this in our daily lives is when we do something, anything, we have to think, why am I doing this? What is the purpose behind my actions? Because everything that the Prophet ﷺ did had a purpose behind it. That he was able to see the bigger picture behind his actions and as, as a result, he got better results in the long term. In the end, they were able to perform Umrah. In the end, Allah gave them additional reward for having performed their Umrah. And in the end, the people of Makkah came to Islam because they saw the good character of the Prophet ﷺ. We see in his entire life 
the sense of creativity in how he dealt with situations in a way that would make everyone happy. Even before the Prophethood, when the Prophet ﷺ was around 35 years old, uh, the people of Makkah decided to rebuild the Kaaba because it was, you know, it was a lot smaller than it is now. It wasn't, it didn't have a roof at the time. Uh, you know, it, it was not as structurally stable or things like that. So they decided that they should rebuild it. And a lot of things happened that supported them in this. That there was a, a ship from Greece that actually crashed on the shores of Jadda. And because of that, they had access to a lot of wood that they needed to rebuild it. When they went to go rebuild it, there was a snake that uh, decided to set up a shop in front of the Kaaba and hissed at anyone who would approach it. And they took this as a sign that, okay, we shouldn't try to mess with the Kaaba. Allah doesn't want us to do this. Right? And one day, an eagle came down and struck the snake and took it away. And they took this as a sign that, okay, now maybe Allah is okay with us rebuilding. So, they're very careful. And at every stage of the way, they're, you know, okay, make sure that we're doing it. We're not doing anything disrespectful to the Kaaba and we're rebuilding it. Right? And slowly and slowly, they manage to rebuild it. Then the last step comes where they have to put the black stone back into the Kaaba. And this is where things get violent. Okay, because everyone wants the right of putting the stone back. Okay, and there's a bunch of groups that form that say, no, my group is going to put the stone into the Kaaba. No, my group's going to do it. Right, and, and this gets really heated. Okay, so then they don't know what to do. So uh, someone in the group, an old man, he says, okay, whoever is the next guy to come in, let him arbitrate. Okay, like, let, let's have someone arbitrate. And lo and behold, the Prophet ﷺ, Muhammad walks through the door. Okay, so now everyone says, okay, we trust this guy. He's a good guy. We're going to trust whatever he does. So what is, he, what is his solution to the problem? He gets, he, he gets a rug, like, a, uh, like a, a sheet. He puts the stone on the sheet. He has each of the four groups send a person to hold the seat from one of its corners. They lift it up together, bring it to the Kaaba, and then the Prophet ﷺ picks it up and puts the stone in place. Now what are things that we can learn from this? That how is the Prophet ﷺ able to come up with this creative solution? One thing that we can see is that he was thinking about everyone involved in this situation. He was thinking, he was, it would very, be very easy to fall into a trap of thinking who is the most, uh, you know, deserving of the right to pick up this stone and put it into the Kaaba. That could be a very easy trap to fall into and you could have done that. But he's thinking that, you know, this group, they have a good point and this group also has a good point. In fact, all of these guys, I can see that they want to do this, right? And if I give one person the opportunity to do it, then another person will be deprived of it. How we can apply this in our daily lives is in any interaction that I have at my workplace or with my family. Anything that I'm doing, I have to think, how is it going to affect other people? How is it going to affect my children, my spouse, my parents, my co-workers, people in my community? If I think beyond myself about the things that I'm doing, that, I able, that enables me to think of more creative solutions to problems, more creative solutions for interacting with people. It enables me to do things in a way that pleases everyone, like the Prophet ﷺ does here. If I put, my shell, my, put myself in other people's shoes, then I'm able to talk to them in a way that is beneficial to them and with compassion. The Prophet ﷺ used to listen to people. That everyone who came to talk to him recognized that he understood what they were going through. And it's, it sounds simple, but we have two ears and one mouth. And oftentimes, I think that gets forgotten. That listening is a lot more important than speaking. That in order to truly speak to a person, whether it's, you know, simple small talk, you know, at the store or whatever, whether it's something serious, you know, whether it's with our families, listening is a key component of talking. And when we learn to listen to people, to truly listen where they're coming from, why they're talking, and what they're going for, then that enables us to talk to them better, rather than talking at them in a conversation. The Prophet ﷺ, his speech was concise. And you can see this conciseness in many examples. 
a man once came to kill the Prophet ﷺ. He was sleeping under a tree and a man comes with a sword and he holds the sword over his neck. And the Prophet ﷺ wakes up and sees this guy with a sword over his neck. This is bad. And the guy says, who will save you now? The Prophet ﷺ, he says Allah. And he says it with so much conviction that the man is just so taken aback by this that he's unable, like he drops his sword, he's unable to kill him. And we've talked about conciseness of speech, he just said one word. Like think about all the different ways he could have possibly responded, but he knew the answer to the question, he knew what he believed in, and he responded with conviction. Right? We see this in how Allah speaks in the Qur'an. The, the Qur'an is a very concise book, it's a very concise speech, and it's filled with deep meaning. Which is a lesson for us that in our speech, we should try to be as concise and deep as possible, rather than talking extraneously. When the Prophet ﷺ, when his son passes away, and we know that he had no male descendants, and that at the time, this was considered a very big deal, because, you know, typically your lineage is passed on by your male descendants in, in that culture. So, uh, you know, some of the people of Quraysh, such as Abu Lahab, they were going around making fun of the Prophet ﷺ. Even when, at the time when his son had passed away, when he's going through so much anguish, people like Abu Lahab are actively making fun of him. Just imagine the kind of anguish that a person goes through when their son gets hurt, you know, when their child gets injured, this is a man whose son passed away in his hands. And they're making fun of him. They're saying he's batar, he's batar, he's cut off, which means his lineage is cut off. Right? And how does Allah console him with three verses of the Quran? That here's this giant book, I'm gonna give you three verses to console you. And the lesson, one of the lessons here is that when you console someone, it's good to be concise, you know. Here, I'm here for you, let me give you some words of consolence, but let me also give you some space so that you can, you know, process what happened. You know, oftentimes that's what's necessary. He says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Inna a'tayna kal kawthar. Indeed, we have given you kawthar. And this sentence, the way it's constructed, it says a'tayna ka. It's in like the past tense, that we have given you. It doesn't say we give you or we will give you kawthar. It says, we have given you this thing. And the understanding there is that he's saying that like it's guaranteed that you have it. It's not even a question that you have this thing that's called Gotha. Okay. And you can go into the tafsir of the Shurah shura for a while that Gotha is a river in Jannah. But it also means an abundance and, and a, a countless abundance of good. That is derived from the word Kathara. And it's the most extreme form of that word. And you could say kathir, you could say kathur, but gothar is kind of like an uncountable amount of blessing. And it's strange, and, and one of the reasons that is being said here is that these guys are saying that the Prophet ﷺ has been cut off. He has nothing now. But Allah is saying that you've been giving a countless level of things. Right? Why is this the next thing that's said? So therefore, Pray to your Lord and sacrifice. Why is this the next sentence? Pray to your Lord, as in ignore what they're saying, and focus on what's important to pray to your Lord. One her and sacrifice. When we think of the prophets, which prophet is most known for the legacy of sacrifice? It's Ibrahim a.s. Ibrahim a.s. is the prophet who was given not one but two nations under his progeny. Right? And it's like the, the, his children would be like countless as the stars and so on, right? And his legacy is synonymous with sacrifice. And that's being alluded to just by putting this one word here. Inna shaniyaka huwal abata. And then to conclude that he's saying that no, your enemy is the one who is cut off, right? And you can go very deep into this. But in just these three sentences, we've given so much so concisely and then that's it and then let the person process that speech when it's concise and meaningful it's much more effective than speech which is not something that we should think about when I'm talking when we're talking why am I talking what is the objective that I have in this conversation with someone 
in any conversation. We can apply this in any aspect of our lives. When I'm doing something at the workplace, at school, with my family, why am I doing what I'm doing? What do I want? Because if I truly grasp this, then it'll enable me to resolve conflicts before they even happen. You know, conflict with my spouse. If I know what I want, and then I'm willing to sacrifice and make compromises where necessary. Right? A lot of disagreements occur. A lot of wars begin because of misunderstandings, because people don't understand each other. If you look through history, right? This is serious. A lot of disagreements at the masjid level, in our organizations, in the school level, in our MSAs, at workplace, and whatever, with our spouses, they happen because people don't listen to each other and they don't understand each other. So one of the things that we should make an emphasis on is in listening to each other and trying to understand where they're coming from, right? There's something called empathy and there's something called sympathy. And these two words are often used uh, together interchangeably. But there is a difference, okay? Sympathy is feeling bad for other people, okay? Sympathy is, you know, I, you know, someone tells me what they're going through, someone tells me something, and I feel bad for them, I, you know, my condolences, etc. Empathy is a little deeper than that. Empathy is an addition to be able to put yourself in that person's shoes, okay? And the distinction occurs because sympathy is something that often drives people away, even without realizing it, and empathy brings us together. When I hear what someone has told me, whether it's a bad thing or whether it's just a normal conversation, if I'm able to put myself in their shoes, then I'm able to, you know, share whatever they're going through, and that brings us closer together. For example, how did Prophet Sallallahu implement this? So, uh, Banu Taif was a tribe that lived in the city of Taif. Okay, and we know that the city of Taif really did not like the Prophet, right? He went there to spread Islam, and he said later on that this was the hardest day of my life, that they treated him so badly. They had their kids throw rocks at him, his feet were bleeding, he was in such a bad condition, so demoralized. And even then, he made dua for them afterwards. Later on, many years later, the people from Banu Taqif, they come to the Prophet and they're willing to become Muslim. Okay, and I mean, you know, Islam has grown a lot, the Muslims have become a lot stronger, so it's kind of important for them to deal with this. So they come, and they say, okay, we'll become Muslim, but we don't want to do all of the things. Okay, we don't want to, uh, they first say, okay, we'll become Muslim, but we don't want to destroy our main idol, Lot. Okay, we want to just keep that idol and be allowed to worship it still. And the Prophet's like, what, like what? you can't do that. But he gets annoyed, right? Because you can't just, that doesn't make any sense, right? And they sense that he's annoyed, so they back down from that offer. Okay, sorry. Then they say, okay, fine. But we don't want to give sadaqa or zakat or, you know, we don't want to like do, like we don't want to do jihad or we don't want to pray, right? And the Prophet says, uh, there, there's no good in a religion which does not contain prayers, okay? So they end up negotiating something where they pray like a few times per day or something. Uh, they don't have to give sadaqa, they don't have to give zakat, they don't have to do any of these things, right? And then they agree and then they go home. And the Sahaba are looking at this, right? They're like shocked, they're like, like stunned, like what just happened? Right? Like imagine like an imam, like com someone coming up to an imam and like, okay, I'll become Muslim but I don't want to pray, right? And imam's like, yeah, it's okay, right? Why did he do this, right? He says to a Sahaba who are now like stunned, don't worry, they'll pray and give sadaqah and zakat and do all of these things once they taste the sweetness of it, right? He's able to put himself in their shoes and realize that they're not fully ready to accept this. But once they accept a little of it and taste it, then they'll be ready to do the whole thing, that they need to move in steps. And the Prophet ﷺ is willing to acknowledge that because he has empathy for them. He could very, I mean, he should be angry at them because they're the people who tried to beat him up and gave him the hardest day of his life. But even then, he's willing to empathize with them. And because of that, they end up becoming Muslims and they end up doing all of the things of Islam, right? He's not backing down in his religion by changing it. Rather, he's giving them counsel based on where they're coming from. And I think this is very important. When we give people counsel, when we talk to people, 
every person's situation is different. And one thing to keep in mind is that matters of the nafs are very important and we often don't weigh them as much as we should. We focus too much on external things. You know, like, oh, you're making wuzu correctly, your clothing is whatever, all this. When oftentimes the thing that's more important than that is what's going on in here. What's my state of iman? You know, what's my state of maintaining my prayers? What's my state of, you know, my belief and taqwa? Right? And then once you have that, all of the other things follow. And when we counsel people from that perspective, when we talk to people from that perspective, it's a lot more productive. Right? When you sympathize with someone, this does not happen. Sympathy is like when you're at like a masjid fundraiser and we show you the pictures of, oh, these are the people that are struggling in these situations. And you say, oh, I feel so sorry for them. Let me donate money because I feel bad. You know, you want to get rid of this feeling. It separates you from people. What you want to do is be able to put yourself in other people's shoes. Right? And we can apply this in all aspects of our lives. And this is the sunnah to do so. And that enables us to draw closer to people. You know, I think this is something that's often forgotten that we give very general advice to people. You know, we give very, you know, strict top down. This is what you should do. This is what you shouldn't do. But one thing that gets lost is the human element of how we interact with other people. Which the Prophet ﷺ was a genius at. Like he wasn't good at it. He was literally a genius at communicating with people. And that's something that we should aspire towards. Another example of this, uh, Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, one day he was really hungry. Okay, he hasn't eaten for a long time, he's starving. He's starving so much that he takes a rock and he wraps it around his, his stomach, right, to make the hunger pangs be a little less. Okay, and he decides, okay, if I don't have any food, maybe someone else does and maybe I can get them to invite me over and have some food. So he stands on the road where a lot of people go by. And he sees Abu Bakr uh, go by. And he says to Abu Bakr, Salam, okay, and he asks him a question about like uh, Quran or something, you know, to try to start a conversation and hopefully then that, uh, could everyone please try to move to the side to make space? That he, he starts this conversation that maybe Abu Bakr will take me home and then we'll have food and, every, and I'll be fed, right? Abu Bakr doesn't do that at all and, you know, they talk and then he moves on, okay? So then he, he's on the road and then Umar radiallahu anhu comes and he does the same thing, he goes salam to Umar, he asks him about some verse of the Quran, you know, and Umar radiallahu anhu, he doesn't like get it and he, you know, that, that happens. And then the Prophet sallallahu walks, comes walking along, you know, and to put yourself in these shoes, like what would you do? You see this person, this guy who's your friend and he's randomly like, hey, what's your favorite surah? Like, oh, I don't know, I don't have a favorite, like... Why is he asking that question? What might, where is he coming from? What is, you know, what does he really want? Right? If you're able to recognize that, then you're able to see where he's coming from. The Prophet ﷺ, he doesn't even say anything, right? He doesn't even, Abu Huraira doesn't even have to say anything. He sees his face and he immediately knows that he's hungry. Right? He immediately says, what's up? And then he takes him to his house. Right? He doesn't even need to say anything because the Prophet ﷺ knows, he recognizes it. He takes him to his house and they say, okay, what do we have? So they have a bowl of milk, okay? They somehow get this bowl of milk, okay? And the Prophet ﷺ, he says, get, uh, go get the people of, uh, of your tribe, okay? Go bring them all over. And there's like 70 people in his tribe, right? And why does he do this? Well, if this man is hungry, then probably his people are also hungry. It's not like they're well fed and he's like not well fed, right? So he goes and brings them over. And Abu Huraira is thinking, oh man, now all these people are going to drink from this. I'm not going to be fed. This is, oh, oh, like, oh, well, okay. So he goes to bring his people and he's not very happy. He's not very, like, excited. He goes and from this thing of milk, everyone drinks their fill somehow. This was one of the miracles of the Prophet ﷺ. And then Abu Huraira drinks it last because it's tradition that the host drinks last. And that was one of the reasons why he's kind of, you know, not too happy about this because he's the host now. He drinks his full, he drinks his full multiple times over, and then the Prophet ﷺ takes it and finishes the milk. When we are able to put ourselves in other people's shoes, see how much of a difference that makes, that the Prophet ﷺ was able to do this. <coughs> and when we do things worrying about others and thinking about others, Allah puts barakah in our actions. 
He put baraka in that thing of milk. So what we should focus on is how we are talking. It goes without saying that I shouldn't be backbiting, speaking ill of someone, all of these things, right? That the Prophet ﷺ emphasized so much, you know, there's a hadith that a man asked, what are the deeds that will take me into paradise and keep me away from hellfire? And the Prophet lists all of these things. And at the end of it, he says, and shall I tell you of the controlling of all that? He said, yes, O Messenger of Allah. So he took hold of his tongue and said, restrain this. I said, O Prophet of Allah, will be held accountable for what we say? He said, may your mother be bereft of you. Is there anything that topples peoples on their faces into the hellfire other than the jests of their tongues? So we should be careful about what we're saying. And moreover than that, we should be strategic in our talking and our actions. This will enable our masjids to be better, our careers to be better, our family relations to be better. When non-Muslims look at us, and they, you know, they're judging us as Muslims, we're able to set a better example that way, right? As we're going into this month of Ramadan, and I hope everyone is working on or has developed a plan that they have for things that they want to do in Ramadan, one of the things that I think you should focus on is this idea of speech and of etiquette, right? Because this is something that's universal. This is not something that uh, there's a difference of opinion in. Even people outside Islam, everyone automatically recognizes what is good manners, what is good empathy, what is good speech, right? This is something that is universal, right? It should be a cornerstone of our religion. So when we're focusing and we're getting ready for Ramadan, we should be thinking about this and Allah will put barakah in our actions, inshallah, right? And we should be disciplined in whatever we're doing. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين فاستغفروا إنه هو الغفور الرحيم. بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم. So as I conclude, I just want to say a few last remarks. Um, uh, for Ramadan, I just want to say one word, which is discipline. A lot of the reasons why people often show up for Tarawih in the first few nights of Ramadan, and then it fades out, and then it comes back towards the end, is because discipline is not there. Whatever you decide to do, be disciplined about it. Try to be as disciplined as possible, and you need to prepare beforehand. If my goal is to read a certain amount of Qur'an or do a certain amount of whatever per day in Ramadan, I'm not just going to wake up on the first day and start doing it. I should, you know, this last week before Ramadan, I should spend preparing in some way, practicing, doing some of that, so that when it starts, I can get rolling. And I can be disciplined with myself. Another thing is priorities. Prioritize Fard over... Uh, so things like Fard are more important than Sunnah, right? So praying Jamaat, Isha and Fajr is more important and more rewarding than praying Tarawih, for example, right? We want to have our priorities straight and we want to keep that in mind, okay? So we have some announcements before I finish. Uh, there's a graduation ceremony for uh, the school tonight at 6.30 p.m., inshallah. Uh, please come join. There'll be, uh, you know, all the kids will be there. They've worked hard over the years. They have some presentations, performances, and stuff to show you. So please come out and support them. Uh, that's at 6.30 p.m. here. And then tomorrow night, uh, at 7 p.m. there's a Ramadan team meeting just to finalize the Ramadan plans uh, you know they need volunteers uh, for Ramadan and that's a good source of, of good deeds that you should try to volunteer if you can or if you have any ideas for Ramadan programming and you want to help out with that please come to the Ramadan meeting tomorrow at 7 p.m. Allahumma sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama sallaita ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim anna tahmidu majid Allahumma barik ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama barakta ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim anna tahmidu majid O Allah forgive us for our sins O Allah put us on the straight path O Allah make us be people who are compassionate O Allah make us be people who care about others O Allah enable us to be people who have empathy O Allah do not make us people who are heartless O Allah make our words have wisdom and purpose O oh Allah, do not let us do things that are without meaning. O oh Allah, let all of our actions be only for your sake, and your sake alone. O oh Allah, please help our brothers and sisters around the world who are struggling. O oh Allah, please help our brothers and sisters in Philistine who are in strife. O oh Allah, please help our brothers and sisters in Egypt. O oh Allah, please help our brothers and sisters in Syria and Iraq. O 
Oh Allah, please help our brothers and sisters in Pakistan. Oh Allah, please help our brothers and sisters in our own cities here in this country. Oh Allah, please protect us from oppression and persecution. Oh Allah, and enable us to bring us closer together. Oh Allah, enable us to only do what is right and forgive us for all our sins and please accept this from us. ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا زاد النار سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلاما على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين عباد الله إن الله يعمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينحى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغ يعزكم لعلكم تذكرون أذكر الله يذكركم واشكروه يزدكم واتقوه يجعل لكم مخرجا وقيم الصلاة
الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله